Hi, my name is Shannon, and I'm a sinner. And I trust that you know that that introduction and that greeting are sincere. I don't want to sin defined by missing the mark or waywardness or rebellion or disobedience. I don't want sin to be a part of my life. Uh, It just is. It always has been. It always will be. Of course, uh, I, like you, would like to see that sin in decreasing uh, evidence in my life, uh, less and less frequent and lesser and less degrees. I hope and trust that with God's help, that's the case as I strive to follow Jesus, seek to follow Jesus, and live into his kingdom. I trust the same is true for you as well. So hi, my name is Shannon, and I'm a sinner. Beyond that, though, who am I? Who am I? And who are you? It's an interesting question. I was born a long time ago, not as long ago as some of you, uh, but longer ago than some of you. Uh, If my life, if I was to illustrate it with a timeline of sorts, Uh, It would include changes in my family, moves to different homes and locations and states, various formative events, changes in health, stages of faith, various activities, successes and failures, ups and downs, ebbs and flows. And through all of that and throughout all of that, the question remains, who am I? Who am I? It's a question that can be asked at every age and stage of a person's life. It's a question that's pertinent all of the time, regardless of what's going on in one's life or how one is, because something is always going on, and a person always is. So who who am I? And who are you? Who are we? The question often gets answered consciously or subconsciously with the words or the thought, I am what I do. And this is very real, I think, for most of us. And when we do good things, we feel better about ourselves. We feel good about ourselves, we like ourselves. The voice that we hear goes like this. Look at this success you've had at work or in your vocation or on a project, or as a volunteer, or as a part of a team, or for other people, or for your family, or neighbors, or even strangers. Look at the difference that you've made. You've made a difference. Look at the success you've had. Look at my life. I did something good. I matter. I made a difference. I am making a difference. I have, therefore, value. I am what I do. A second way that the who am I question is sometimes answered is, I am what I have. A person may have notable parents or a pedigree or a background, I'm Greek. A person may have family, at least until that family is no more or goes away or turns themselves from one. Or I have property, I have possessions, I have things, I own things, an automobile, musical instruments, jewelry, grown-up toys, a club membership. I have a portfolio, I have assets, I have children, I have a home, a person's home is their castle. I have things, I have a body, I have clothes, and maybe these things that in some way I have are a source for me of security or Identity, they're part of and they shape who I am. There's a third way that the who am I question is also sometimes answered consciously and subconsciously, and that is I am what others say about me or what others think about me. I am what others think about me, say about me, what other people say about you or think about you can be very powerful. Think about that in your life for a moment. What other people say about you and think about you can be very powerful for a person. In fact, this is often the most important thing in people's lives. When someone says negative things about you, either to you directly or behind your back, 
that can push a person into depression and a deep, deep darkness. One negative or critical comment among a voice of many comments can sometimes be the only one that you hear or that I hear. A hurtful comment, someone calls you ignorant or selfish or implies something like that. Such comments have the potential to completely change a person's mood, ruin a person's day, ruin a person's week, ruin a person's month. Sticks and stones may break one's bones, but actually words, words can really hurt too. And so, I am what I do, I am what I have, I am what others say or think about me. And when a person does good and or impressive or important things and is able to do such things, and when a person has things, possesses things, has people in one's life or one's corner or has positive, strong relationships, and when others are saying nice, pleasant, affirming, positive things about one, sometimes because of the good things one has done, one tends to feel up, this sort of high, good about oneself. But when a person's not doing really productive, fruitful, successful things, or is not able to do such, and when others are not saying good, positive, uplifting, encouraging things about one, or when I don't possess or no longer possess things that I once possessed or think I ought to possess or could possess or want to possess, then one feels or can feel down. And so over the course of our years, sometimes we're up and sometimes we're down and we try to minimize the downs and we try to stay above that sort of line wherever, whatever that line is. Sometimes we try desperately. We need to in order to feel good about ourselves and who we are. And Jesus, I imagine, went through something like this, something like what we go through most notably and maybe most obviously just before the beginning of his public ministry. During this 40-day stretch when he's out in the wilderness being tempted by the devil, which we read about in chapter three of Luke's gospel. Let me pray, God, Father, Son, and Spirit, speak to us through your word. Amen. Luke chapter three, verse one, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan River where John was baptizing and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Jesus ate nothing during those days and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus was tempted to do great things, to do important things, to impress people with his activity and his actions. Jesus answered, it's written, man does not live by bread alone. The devil led Jesus then up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to Jesus, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It's been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus was tempted by the things that he could have the right to claim things as his own, as belonging to him. And Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here for it's written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up on their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Imagine what wonderful things the angels would say about and to Jesus. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus recognized the devil's temptations. He recognized the devil's deceptions. He recognized the devil's schemes. He recognized that these were all falsehoods and Jesus knew who he was. In the passage of scripture that immediately precedes this one, in Luke's account, Jesus' 40 days, we read these words. When all the people were being baptized by John the Baptist in the wilderness, in a wilderness, maybe the same wilderness, maybe a different one nearby, 
When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Hear that again. You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Who was Jesus? He was the son of his father. That's who he was. Certainly he was a lot of other things as well. He was and he would be prophet, priest, king, rabbi, teacher, preacher, healer, miracle worker, master, messiah, savior, lamb of God, Lord, God himself. But the voice, the voice, it's a different one than the TV, but the voice with a capital V. The voice at the beginning of his public ministry and before his great temptation, did not speak of any of those things, but instead said, you are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And Jesus made it not only through the 40 days in the wilderness, but also through three sometimes grueling years of public ministry, which so often included pressures and expectations and accusations, confrontations, threats, and persecution. Jesus Jesus made it through those three years because Jesus knew who he was. And specifically because he knew that he was the son of his father, the beloved son of his father, the one in whom his father took such delight. With you I am well pleased. And did you notice, do you notice, let's notice how those words fit together in the narrative and Jesus' timeline and Jesus' timeline. Normally when someone says to their, to another person or for example, their child or to someone else, with you I am so pleased. In other words, I'm so pleased with you, I'm so proud of you, or you bring me such delight. It is because of what that child or that person with whom one is pleased has done. Something they've done, a way they've been, but Jesus hadn't done anything yet. Do you see that? Jesus hadn't done anything yet, no public ministry, no casting out of demons, no healing people, no walking on water, no multiplying loaves and fishes, no amazing teaching, no confronting the religious authorities, nothing. The Father's love was not in any way, shape, or form connected to or dependent on what Jesus had done, what Jesus had done possessed what Jesus had earned or otherwise come to possess or what people had said about him, were saying about him, would say about him. And yet he was his father's beloved, the apple of his father's eye. If God the Father had a refrigerator in heaven, in his mansion in heaven, I'm speaking facetiously, I don't really think there's that... Maybe there's a mansion, not a refrigerator. But if there was, there would be on that refrigerator one magnet, not a cluttered bunch of magnets with notes, but one magnet holding up a picture of his beloved, Jesus. That's it. That's it. And the father didn't just love the son because the father had to, because theologically or doctrinally he was supposed to. No, the Father loved Jesus because God is love and because God had freely chosen to love and adore and cherish his son, Jesus. That's how God is. Sort of ontologically, that's who and how God is. And one gets the impression that the Father didn't just love Jesus, he also liked him. 
sometimes I think we can sort of hear, oh, God loves you. God loves the world. But not think or realize or accept that God also likes us. Subconsciously, I sometimes wonder if we realize that God the Father's disposition toward his children is not some cold, doctrinal, have-to love. The love of God the Father for the Son, Jesus, is like a parent at an end-of-school assembly who, when his child's name is called and his child steps forward to receive his participation award, his father stands up alone when everyone else is seated and stands on his chair and begins to clap and say, that's my kid, and pull out one of those loud, obnoxious horns and start blowing it and releasing balloons and saying, he's my beloved. Way to go, buddy. And celebrating regardless of what people think about him because his beloved is on display for just a moment and his voice will not be silenced. His voice will not be silenced. Crazily waving his arms, releasing balloons because that is his child whom he loves and with whom he is well pleased even for just a participation award. Regardless of what his child has done or would do, regardless of what he possessed, regardless of what people might have said or not said about him. And while Bible scholars discuss the significance and the meaning of Jesus' baptism, kind of a little unusual, Certainly a part of that event was the incarnate Jesus witnessing the presence, with a capital P, of his father coming down from the heavens and descending on him in bodily form like a dove, and at the same time hearing the words, this is my son whom I love, with whom I am greatly pleased. And Jesus, knowing who he was, at least partly from that event, and maybe primarily from that event, and those words from the heavens enabled Jesus not only to fend off the temptations of the devil, in the wilderness for those 40 days, but also allowed him to understand that who he was and his belovedness was not dependent on what he did, what he possessed, or what people said or would say about him. And people would say a lot about him. Not all of it very good or nice. Instead, Jesus was able to live confidently in the knowledge and the reality of his belovedness. And that made and that makes all the difference in the world. And out of that belovedness, Jesus was able to do what he was called to do and to be who he was called to be without regard to what he had or didn't have or what others might say about him. And out of, and I think, I think when I think about it, it was only out of his belovedness that Jesus was able to love other people. It was only out of his awareness of his belovedness that he was enabled and empowered to love other people in the same way. With no strings attached, no caveats, no asterisks, no conditions, no qualifications, none. One of the many examples of this is found in chapter eight, the beginning of chapter eight uh, in Matthew's gospel, right after, right at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. So right, Matthew five, six, and seven, Jesus' high ethical teachings, he raises the bar. He says, you have heard that it was said, but I say, he doesn't reject uh, the Old Testament law, the books of Moses. In fact, he elevates them, right? He elevates them, this high bar. The, the Jewish authorities must have been going, yes, we love this guy. Immediately after that, chapter eight, verse one, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, Sermon on the Mount, comes down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him, a man with leprosy, just body riddled with leprosy, came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and he touched the man. 
I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the man was cleansed of his leprosy. And this man you know was categorized as ritually unclean. He approaches Jesus and asks to be made clean and Jesus does does just that for him, but only after touching. Only after. I don't know, maybe he embraced him. All the leprosy everywhere. Only after. According to purity laws, religious practices, and social standards of the day, Jesus should have if he had the power to and the inclination to and the will to, should have cleansed the man first. And then and only then might touching the man be permissible. Again, by purity laws, religious practices, social standards, and every element of hygiene. But Jesus touching the man, making contact, human contact with the man, expressing tender care for the man, was not dependent on the man's being healed and made clean. And Jesus' point in doing it this way was to affirm to the man and to others in his presence who were watching and around and observing this man's inherent belovedness to Jesus and to Jesus' Father, even in his leprosy, was unaffected by his leprosy. He was inherently lovable, loved, to be loved, even when and as and where the world said, unclean, unclean. This is actually pretty extraordinary. It goes counter to the way our hearts work on their own and how the world works for sure. Those whom the world considers to be pariahs, outcasts, unclean, defiled, damaged goods, Jesus declares in word and deed to be God's dearly beloved. Just as the voice from the heavens had spoken to him, about him, into his life, heart, mind. And of course, you and I aren't Jesus, right? He had his experience. We're not Jesus. Jesus remains the only son of God capital S, and uniquely loved by God. But the message of the scriptures and of Jesus is that we too in Christ are God's beloved and we desperately need to hear that and receive it. I do. We need to hear it. We need to believe it. We need to appropriate it. We need to embrace it. We need to live into that as best we can with God's help and in God's grace. But for a lot of us, that's really hard. Don't raise your hand outwardly, but... Raise your hand, is that hard for you? Is it sometimes hard for you when you really think about it and look inside? Because of what we've been taught, because of how we've been taught, because of what we've seen modeled, because of how the world works, because of the conditional love we've received and sometimes not received from parents and other people and places in authority in our lives, through the church, from preachers and pastors who have not been and maybe never have been converted to the reckless love of God. The world and too often our families and our schools and our teachers and our peers and our neighbors and Christian friends, mentors, pastors push a worldview that suggests that our value and our loveliness and our lovability is based on what we do, what we have, and what other people are saying and thinking about us. Imagine the oppressiveness of that for our souls and the alternative that's available. So who am I? I am what I do, the voice says. I am what I have. I'm all of those things. I am what people say about me. That, in other words, those things, those things, often fleeting things, determine my value, my worth, significance. And Jesus says lies. Lies, those are lies. Those are lies. We must recognize them as lies. Get behind me, Satan. But too many of us deep down inside, just deep down inside, have been slaves to such thinking and so also slaves to such being. Who am I? 
God's response to Jesus and also to us is that you are my beloved, the beloved, dearly loved by God, not because of what you do or have or what people say or think about you, because you were made in the image of a loving God, made in that God's image, imbued from the time you were in your mother's womb with worth and value and beauty. Every one of us in here, every one of them out there driving to the church on up to the campus early this morning, 24th Avenue. Literally on that first block away from the church, there was a man sitting on the sidewalk. He may have just been sleeping, but I, I assumed he was passed out, disheveled, clearly homeless, and in this position. Asleep, passed out, I don't know. And I had that internal story about do I have time to stop? What, what would that involve? What would that? But that man must know, God bring it about today somehow, that he is God's beloved. That he, just as much as you and me and church people and Christians, is God's beloved, not because of what he's done. One might guess he hasn't done a lot recently of value in the world's eyes. There's nothing that you can do to cause God to love you more and nothing that you can do to cause God to love you less. You are loved, you have value, you have infinite, immeasurable, incalculable, endless worth because God made you, because his eyes are on you, the scriptures say. Not as an aloof observer or a harsh critic or a condemning judge, but as loving father. Imagine that if you never have before. Aware of one's faults and shortcomings and secrets and the shame Liz prayed about. Hear the gentle yet powerful voice from the heavens and from eternity speaking and saying to you, you are my child. Just close your eyes and hear those words. You too are my child, whom I love and with whom I am well pleased. Imagine if you can being loved and adored in that way you are. Imagine being fully and completely accepted and loved just as you are and not as you should be. You are. May the voice of the imposter be silenced. The voices that say you haven't done enough, you haven't had enough, you aren't enough. May those voices be silenced forever. That is not the voice of your Father in heaven whose love has no end. And by God's grace, may every one of us live in the freedom of this good news, freedom that some of us have never experienced. In God's grace, may we be rescued from self-condemnation and fear. In God's grace, may we be saved from thinking that we have to prove ourselves to ourselves and to others and to God. And in God's grace, may we be vessels of the Father's relentless and unconditional love to a world that believes that they and we are defined and have worth and value and belovedness based on what we do, what we have, and what people think about us. May we, with Jesus, hear clearly the voice of God saying, The Jews didn't really, maybe you know this already, the Jewish people didn't really have a history of knowing God as Father. Jesus really introduced that. And most of the time in, in the Greek, the, the word is a word that most easily is translated Father. But a couple of times, there in the New Testament, 
It's a word that can't easily or best be translated father. It's the word Abba, Daddy. It's more than an aloof father out there who just, I filled out a lot of forms over the last week for our kids at the dentist, you know, different things like that. What is your relationship to the patient? Father. Jesus says, your relationship with is, is daddy. And it's different. So may we, with Jesus, hear clearly the voice of God saying, I knit you together in your mother's womb. I have loved you with an everlasting love. You are mine and I am yours. And these words, inspired by the Holy Spirit, written down by the disciple John, who understood himself as beloved by Jesus, right? I mean, it's a little awkward. He says, uh, refers, self refers to himself and is cryptically as the disciple whom Jesus loved. But that didn't mean that he loved that he thought Jesus loved him more than everyone else. It just means that he understood God's love through Jesus for him, the disciple loved by Jesus. That's who he understood himself to be. He wrote these words in his first letter, may we receive them. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, in Jesus Christ, that we should be called children of God. Uh, little Kayla Yu ran over to me during uh, the scene and she gave me one of these little cards that um, she was making this morning with the folks who were making sandwiches and she was uh, putting them in all of the little bags for the people who are under housed or without houses or homes this afternoon will get to read when they open their lunch bags. Just a star and a smiley face and the message, you are loved. God loves you. Let's pray. We open our hands and our hearts to you, God, literally and figuratively.